Good evening. Pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. My name is Bill Caves, and uh, I represent the off-campus group, the Vancouver chapter of Reasons to Believe, that has uh, invited the guest for this evening. And it's my privilege to introduce to you astronomer, author, and apologist, Dr. Hugh Ross. Hugh was born in Vancouver, and he did his undergraduate studies here. Yep. He got his Bachelor of Science in Physics right here. As a matter of fact, he mentioned last night that he has memories of being in this room many, many times during that time. He also has a Master of Science and a, a, a Doctor of Philosophy in Astronomy from U of T. After gra graduating, he went to work as a postdoc fellow at Caltech to study galaxies and uh, quasars. <clears throat> he was the founder of Reasons to Believe, and he has authored and co-authored 10 books. Uh, one of the most recent books he wrote is uh, Creation as Science, and the one most recently that has come out is Why the Universe Is the Way It Is. Hugh has uh, talked and uh, debated and held seminars and spoken at over 300 universities and educational and academic centers throughout the U.S., Canada, and the world. And uh, just recently, as a matter of fact, uh, two weeks ago, today, he was over at the Skeptic Society Conference and he debated uh, the, uh, the well-known atheist and uh, particle physicist, Victor Steiner. So that gives you some idea as to what circles he walks in and uh, that he uh, uh, talks with and discusses with. Now Dr. Hugh Ross is going to uh, give a talk this evening on putting creation to the test. After that will be a time of Q&A and uh, just relax and uh, enjoy tonight. Dr. Hugh Ross. Well, this room indeed does bring back mem many memories. I think I... Is it, it sound okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah, say so this room brings back many memories. I've probably spent a good hey, part of my life just sitting in these chairs here. Uh, taking notes from different physics professors uh, that I studied under here at the University of British Columbia. And uh, as mentioned, the theme tonight is uh, putting the creation to the test. And what I'm going to try to do for you is give you a quick overview of the testable creation model we've developed of reasons to believe, but in particular show you the different ways, some of the different ways uh, we can put it to the test. Now, I don't know what it's like up here in Canada, but in the United States, uh, there's quite a controversy over intelligent design. And a lot of what we do at Reasons to Believe is intelligent design, but we're not the intelligent design movement. Uh, they've been roundly and I think fairly criticized uh, for putting out a proposal that's not falsifiable, that's not testable, that's not predictive. Mainly because they refuse to identify the designer. Uh, but what we're talking about is a testable model, so uh, I don't want you to think that uh, we're in any way uh, part of the intelligent design movement. Now, I did not come here to try to prove to you that God exists. Uh, science cannot prove the existence of anything. And, uh, you know, 31 years ago I got married, and on our wedding day I told my wife that I was marrying her without the proof of her existence. And it meant absolute proof. All I had was a high probability of her existence. And that's really what science can do. Science can develop probabilities. And the whole question is, can we establish the existence of a divine being, for example, to within a measurable uncertainty? And uh, is the uncertainty small enough that we can eliminate some of the alternate explanations? So that's what we're about here this evening. And as Paul Davies mentioned, Design really isn't the argument. That's not the debate question. Every scientist agrees that we see design in the record of nature. Uh, we see it at the astronomical level, we see it at the biological level. 
What really is the issue is the nature of the design. So nobody disputes design, but they do dispute who or what that designer could be. Now in terms of trying to identify the designer, is it naturalism, is it Darwinism, is it the God of the Bible? A couple of questions that we can ask in terms of this identification. Is the evidence for the existence of the Creator growing or shrinking as we learn more and more about the record of nature? I mean, if the evidence is shrinking, then we would say that would be uh, an indication that the naturalistic explanations indeed may be correct. But if it's growing, that would be an argument in favor of a divine designer. And again, is the evidence of sufficient import that we can eliminate some or all the alternate explanations? Now, what I'm talking about tonight uh, is a biblical model. And the first book I ever read on cosmology, the science of the structure and origin of the universe, uh, was by Sir Fred Hoyle, the book called The Nature of the Universe. And what he said in that book is that there's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. Let me pull this back for you. There's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. Now keep in mind, Sir Fred Hoyle was a pantheist. He was not at all a theist. But he was noting that in terms of looking at the different religions of all the holy books, the Bible had far more content than cosmology. Indeed, it's about 10 times more than what you'll find in any of the holy books. And if you were to go through the Bible, there's three cosmological points that it makes over and over again. There's a lot of detail, but the three main points are as follows. That the universe is traceable back to a cosmic singularity beginning. And the Bible defines that as a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. That the universe continuously expands from that point of beginning. And it's a universe that gets colder and colder as it gets older and older. So in terms of where the origins of Big Bang cosmology come from, indeed Albert Einstein deserves a lot of the credit, but as a matter of fact, Bible authors were talking about Big Bang cosmology two and three thousand years ago. Now, I think at least a few of you in this room may be aware of some of the Bible passages that talk about the singularity beginning. I find that no matter where I speak in the world, everybody seems to know the first sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word that's used there for create is to bring something into existence brand new that never existed before. And the phrase for the heavens and the earth uh, refers to the entire physical universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Hebrews 11.3 makes the point that the universe that we can see and detect did not come from that which we can see and detect. And then other Bible verses that are not included here uh, speak about an actual beginning of space and time uh, when the universe began. Uh, you know, we have Timothy and Titus speaking about this space-time beginning. Now, I was a graduate student at the University of Toronto when the first of the space-time theorems was published. And these space-time theorems demonstrate that if general relativity reliably describes the dynamics of the universe, and if the universe contains mass, then space and time must at the beginning, matter of fact, space and time must be created by some causal agent outside or beyond or transcending space and time. Uh, but back in 1970, astronomers were not able to prove the reliability of general relativity to any great deal of precision. Uh, at that time, it was only 1% precision. But what has happened uh, since that time, in the last 38 years, is that many tests have been developed and performed on the reliability of general relativity. And it is such that the strength and the number of experimental evidences for the reliability of general relativity are growing. And the point here, this is really the only significant assumption that's behind these space-time theorems. If general relativity reliably describes the dynamics of the universe, then indeed there must be this causal agent beyond space and time. And it is such today, in the words of Roger Penrose, one of the co-authors of the first of the space-time theorems, that general relativity today ranks as the most exhaustively tested and best proven principle in all of physics. And a couple of experiments done in binary neutron stars 
show that it reliably describes the dynamics of the universe to nearly 15 places in the decimal, to better than a trinth of a percent of that precision. The other thing that's happened in the intervening 38 years <coughs> is that these space-time theorems have become much more general. The first of the space-time theorems was in the context of classical general relativity, uh, but over a 10-year period, uh, two theoretical physicists, Arvin Borde and Alexander Blinken, uh, published these five papers. And what they did in these five papers from 1993 to 2004 is they looked at the space-time theorems and asked the question, is there some way we can get around the singularity beginning? Or are we really stuck with a causal agent beyond space and time? And so they tried to find ways around it, and they were successful. They did find formulations, mathematical formulations of the universe, where there was no beginning of space and time. But they discovered these were universes that would not permit the existence of life. And in the last of their five papers, uh, they concluded that uh, any universe that expands on average must have a beginning in the finite past. It doesn't matter whether it's an inflationary universe or uh, you've got some kind of quantum gravity going on. If the universe expands on average, then there really is this singularity, this beginning of space and time, and an agent beyond space and time. Or, as they put it, all reasonable expanding universe models are subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems of general relativity. And what they mean by reasonable, a universe that would permit the existence of physical life. Now, I've spent quite a bit of time just on this one theme, because what we're developing here is a rigorous scientific demonstration that there must be this causal agent beyond space and time that's responsible for bringing the universe into existence. But at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that we're discussing a testable creation model. <coughs> and for a model to be testable, it must make predictions. So just based on this one theme, uh, we're offering several predictions. And here are a few of those predictions, just based on this beginning. We would predict that as astronomers learn more and more about the universe, that evidence for a single cosmic beginning, as opposed to no beginning or multiple beginnings, would grow and that evidence that time is finite rather than infinite uh, would increase, that evidence for general relativity for widely describing cosmic dynamics would grow. Matter of fact, there's experiment underway right now, the gravity B probe satellite, uh, that's uh, testing that one aspect of general relativity <coughs> would have the uh, least precision, the lens throwing effect. And I would expect that sometime early in 2009, those results will be published and that we're predicting that it's going to verify a general relativity in that context. Also, we're predicting that these space-time theorems will become even more relentless as theoreticians try to test uh, the applicability of these theorems, and hence that the case for a transcendent causal agent will gain strength, and that evidence for other miraculous acts will be found. Now, the point that I think needs to be emphasized in light of this whole debate of creation and evolution that's going on around the world, what we have here is evidence physically uh, for a miracle, something happening beyond the laws of physics. And it's the biggest miracle we can imagine, the bringing into existence of the entire universe from something outside of the laws of physics and the space-time dimensions of the universe which means that the door of the supernatural has forcibly been put open. Science can no longer argue that only natural causes can explain the natural realm. Uh, science must be open to the possibility that the causes might be natural or they could be supernatural. Both need to be put to the test. Now, as much as the Bible says about the beginning of the universe, it says much more about the expansion of the universe. Now, this is not general knowledge because it's not in the book of Genesis. In fact, you've got to get all the way to the book of Job before you find the first mention of the continuously expanding universe. But there's actually many more passages in the Bible that talk about the expansion of the universe than there are the those that talk about the beginning of the universe. Now, I made the title there, The Stretching of the Heavens. That's usually how it's translated in the English Bibles. The Hebrew verb that's the basis for that translation is the verb matah. 
And uh, a Hebrew scholar many years ago pointed out to me that that verb ta really is communicating not so much stretching as it is continuous expansion. He also made the point that these ancient Hebrew prophets couldn't have been any more explicit given their language in describing a continuously expanding universe. Matter of fact, as you go through these passages, you'll notice three different Hebrew verb forms uh, that make the point abundantly clear that the universe was created with a physics that would guarantee ongoing continuous expansion, but that also the creator is intimately involved in controlling that expansion from the creation event forward. Now, <clears throat> I've written a couple of books laying out the astronomical evidences we have today that we do indeed live in a continuously expanding universe. I mean, uh, when I first started getting involved in this kind of uh, research, there was a lot of doubt uh, in some circles, do we really live in a continuously expanding universe? That doubt has evaporated. Uh, we now have so many independent demonstrations that we live in a continuously expanding universe uh, that no one can reasonably question uh, that evidence anymore. If you want to read about it, I've got one book at the back called The Crater and the Cosmos that lays out several chapters. But what I would like to show you is a visual demonstration that we live in a continuously expanding universe. And this is thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope. And what we have here are two images from the Hubble Space Telescope. One of a set of galaxies 12 billion light years away <coughs> contrasted with a set of galaxies 2 billion light years away. Now the universe is about 14 billion years old. So what you're seeing there on the left is what the universe looked like when it was 2 billion years old. Uh, pardon me, yeah, 2 billion years old. What you're seeing on the right is what the universe looked like when it was 12 billion years old. Now what you notice is that on the left, the galaxies are jammed much more tightly together. Everything is to scale here. So the galaxies are much closer together when the universe is only 2 billion years old. In fact, so close together that galaxies are literally ripping spiral arms away from one another. We call these tadpole galaxies because of the gravitational forces uh, that are breaking apart the spiral arms. But if you move forward 10 billion years, you see that the galaxies are much farther apart. You also notice the galaxies are bigger. They're bigger because these close interactions when the universe was young, when the universe's space surface was relatively small, resulted in a lot of merger events. Today, merger events are rare because of how the galaxies have been stretched apart. And the other thing you notice there is you can see in the left that the stars are young. They're manifesting, well, it doesn't show up too well in low resolution here, but on my computer you can see that they have purple and blue and deep red and green colors, the colors of young stars, whereas on the right you see that there is the color of yellow, and the color of the older stars. Uh, and you can actually take a look at images of fill it all the way in, you can actually see the universe continuously expanding uh, through these Hubble Space Telescope of photographs. And then we also see within the Bible the statement that the laws of physics are fixed. This is stated repeatedly, but this is just one example in Jeremiah 33, 25. I have established the fixed laws of heaven and earth. And then in Romans 8, it tells us that one law in particular, the law of decay, uh, applies to the entire universe. And if you look at it in the original Greek language, it's talking about the whole space-time continuum of the universe being subject to this pervasive law of decay. And if you read the context of uh, verses 18 to 23, this is a clear reference to the second law of thermodynamics, uh, otherwise known as Murphy's Law, where everything tends towards decay. But the point is this, if the universe is continuously expanding, if the laws of physics are constant, and if the entire universe is subject to this law of decay, the second law of thermodynamics, that's a universe that gets continuously colder and colder as it gets older and colder. <coughs> And knowing the age of the universe, you can predict from these biblical statements exactly how the universe will get colder and colder as it gets older and older. And what I have here in this graph is I take these biblical statements about the cooling of the universe, and that's the curve that there you see plot. That's the, uh, what you would get from what the Bible says about the constant physics, the continuous expansion, and the second law of thermodynamics. 
and overlapping them are actual measurements of the temperature of the radiation that go from the creation event and gas clouds at different distances. And what you can see is the actual measurements indeed fit uh, what you would predict uh, from uh, these different passages uh, in the Bible. And indeed, the universe is getting colder and colder. Now, in terms of on our staff of reasons to believe, we have philosophers and uh, theologians as well as research scientists. And uh, what our historians of science point out to us is that no book outside of the Bible spoke about the continuous expansion of the universe or a universe getting colder and colder with respect to time until the 20th century. Albert Einstein was really the first in his equations of general relativity, the solution of his equations to say the universe may be continuously expanding. But previous to the 20th century, written statements on this uh, were indeed unique to the pages of the Bible. And so this is a case where you see the Bible accurately predicting future scientific discoveries thousands of years ahead of the time. And it's also really isolating the God of the Bible in the sense that if you go to the Eastern religions, for example, they speak about God or gods or cosmic forces creating within space and time that eternally exists. Where the Bible stands alone amongst the world's holy books is making a claim that space and time are finite, they're not infinite, and they're created, and that God creates independent of space and time rather than within space and time. Well, today we know exactly what physical features are governing this cooling of the universe, this expansion of the universe, its gravity and its dark energy. And dark energy is a dominant factor that governs the expansion of the universe. Uh, you don't know what dark energy is. It's an energy that's embedded in the space surface of the universe. Uh, popular literature calls it an anti-gravity term. I really prefer to call it an anti-elastic band. I mean, elastic band has the property that if you stretch the elastic band, the more you stretch it, the more energy it gains to force contraction. The space surface of the universe is the opposite. The more you stretch the surface of the universe, the more energy within that surface is there to accelerate the expansion of the universe. So for example, for the first half of the universe's life, the first eight billion years, seven billion years, uh, <coughs> gravity is stronger than the dark energy. I mean, gravity works that the closer bodies are together, the more powerfully it would cause those bodies to attract. So when the universe is young and the space surface is small, the bodies are close together, gravity is quite powerful in its capacity to slow down the expansion of the universe. But as the universe expands and the space surface gets bigger and bigger, the bodies on that surface get farther apart, gravity becomes progressively weaker, and its capacity to slow down the cosmic expansion, and dark energy becomes progressively stronger in its capacity to accelerate that expansion. Today we know that 72.1% of all the stuff in the universe is dark energy as the dominant factor governing this cosmic expansion. And the rate at which the universe expands determines what kinds of stars and planets you're going to get later in cosmic history. So for example, if you would expand the universe too quickly at early stages in the history of the universe, then gas and dust will never be able to coagulate under the influence of gravity to make stars, galaxies, and planets. The universe would be forever diffuse gas. On the other hand, if you were to expand the universe too slowly, uh, then gravity would be so efficient that it would relatively quickly collect all the matter into black holes. And either way, there's no possibility for life. And you say, well, how much do you have to fine tune it to get the kinds of stars and planets that would make life possible? Well, in uh, this paper written by Lawrence Krauss in the Astrophysical Journal, this is a direct quote. He said, dark energy would involve the most extreme fine-tuning problem known in physics. And he's not a theist, so he referred to it as a problem. And the point he makes in this paper, <coughs> that in order to get the bodies that would make physical life possible, it's necessary to fine-tune the constant governing dark energy to one part in 10 to the 122. That's 122 zeros after the one. And indeed, Lawrence Krauss is right. This is the most extreme fine-tuning problem that we see in physics. And to give you an idea just how extreme, 
the fine tuning of the dark energy term to make light possible exceeds the best example of human engineering design achievement. You know, people have been debating is that the Large Hadron Collider? Well, from what I can tell, uh, the most exquisitely designed machine we've ever built uh, is the laser interferometer. Uh, but if we compare the level of design of the laser interferometer to detect gravity waves uh, with dark energy, dark energy beats it by 10 to the 97 times. Which means that the one beyond space and time that brought the universe into existence and set up the laws of physics at a minimum must be 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent, more knowledgeable than the Caltech and MIT physicists who designed this instrument, or you could say that many times better funded than those Caltech <laughs> and MIT physicists. And the reason why I'm making that point, it's one thing to say that there's some kind of ill-defined entity beyond space and time that creates the universe. But now we're talking about an entity that is personal, because only a personal entity can manifest the properties of intellect and knowledge and creativity and power. And this point was picked up by uh, three theoretical physicists. And, uh, you know, actually one of them, Leonard Susskind, was at this uh, uh, skeptics uh, conference where I debated Victor Stenger. And uh, here's a, a picture of Leonard Susskind there on uh, the left. And, uh, but he and two of his colleagues published this paper titled Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant another term for dark energy. And now what they noted is that if the universe indeed is dominated by dark energy, that's what they mean by arranging the universe as we think it is arranged, what dark energy would have required a miracle. That's a remarkable statement for three atheist theoretical physicists to make publicly. And it went on to say that an external agent, external to space and time, intervene in cosmic history for reasons of its own. Hence the title of the paper, Disturbing Implications. They found this to be so disturbing, the idea that dark energy would point us to an external agent beyond space and time, creating miracles or performing miracles for reason of its own, that they wound up making this statement, this is the last sentence in their paper, they said the only reasonable conclusion is we do not live in a world but a true cosmological constant. In other words, they said dark energy's got to be wrong because if it's right, then we're stuck with this agent beyond space and time making miracles for reasons of its own. Now what I have here is not the article published in the peer-reviewed literature. This was posted on the Los Alamos website for preprints in theoretical physics and it was left up there for about six months. But what happened during those six months as astronomers uh, produced nine independent observational evidences that dark energy is not only real, but it's a dominant component of the universe. And if you go to our reasons.org website, we have an article of every one of these nine discoveries showing that the dark energy is indeed the dominant component of the universe. And when these three authors recognize this, uh, they took the paper down and said, we're not going to publish it. So they withdrew it uh, from uh, publication uh, based on the fact that clearly we do live in a universe dominated by dark energy. Nevertheless, we're left with the conclusions of this agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of its own. Now, this is not the only evidence we have for supernatural fine-tuning design of the universe for the benefit of physical life. We actually see this all across the laws and constants of physics of the universe. That if you're wanting to have physical life, namely life built on carbon, you not only have to fine tune the dark energy parameter and the mass density of the universe, you have to fine tune all the four fundamental forces of physics. For example, the ratio of the electromagnetic force to the gravitational force must be fine tuned to within one part and 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion uh, for physical life to be possible. Now, uh, when I did my debate at Caltech uh, eight days ago, uh, Victor Stenger made the point, well, all you're doing is showing that carbon-based life requires all this fine-tuning. What about silicon-based life? What about boron-based life? 
Well, we had our staff biochemist there, and he had tried me ahead of time that it's not possible to have complex bonds where you've got both stability and instability. That's a remarkable thing about carbon, as it allows you to have DNA, for example, which is very stable chemical bonding, at the same time you get an RNA, which is less stability, which allows information to be transferred from one set of molecules to another molecule. And carbon really is the only game in town. In fact, experiments have been done with silicon showing that if you try to put more than 100 amino acids into a silicon protein, it immediately falls apart. And even when you're at 50, you know, you've got extreme instability. And of course, the vast majority of proteins have way more than 100 isomers uh, in the molecule. So given the laws of physics, carbon-based life is really the only way to go. And there are many more than just these uh, 10 uh, features. In fact, again, if you go to our website, you'll see that as time has been proceeding, uh, the number of known features that demonstrate this extraordinary degree of fine-tuning has been advancing as we learn more and more about the physics and astronomy of uh, the universe. We first started surveying the scientific literature back in 1991, and that's when I came up with The Fingerprint of God, and uh, I think that book is at the back there. By the way, you can't get it in the States, you can only get it in Canada. Uh, that book is sold out in the U.S., but we still have some copies up here. And at that point, only 17 of these fine-tuned features were known, uh, but the last time that we put a, a posting on our website, the list was at 140. Now, this again shows the testing that's going on. The more we learn about the universe, the more evidence we're uncovering uh, for this fine-tuning design. Now, it's not just at the largest size scales that we see this evidence for design, what's called the anthropic principle. You know, what Paul Davies uh, refers to as this overwhelming evidence of repression of design. And he was talking about the universe as a whole, uh, but we also see this at smaller size scales. For example, we note that you, you can't have life in any old galaxy. As many galaxies are as they are, we notice that it's our Milky Way galaxy, which demonstrates uh, dozens of features that must be fine-tuned in order for life to be possible uh, within that galaxy. Moreover, you need a just right star. Again, not only a star will do, we don't see any other stars uh, within our Milky Way galaxy that have all the features that would make advanced life possible. Even though our galaxy is 200 billion stars, the sun remains without a twin, that there is no twin of the sun uh, that would permit the existence of advanced life. Likewise, we see that with Jupiter. Uh, we have now up to 312 gas giant planets that have been discovered outside of our solar system, but none of them are like Jupiter. And uh, without a Jupiter, you're not going to have advanced life existing here on planet Earth. Matter of fact, we discover we need virtually every uh, planet within our solar system. You need a just right Uranus, a just right Neptune, and a just right Saturn, in addition to a just right uh, Jupiter uh, for advanced life to exist on our Earth. And of course, the Earth must be just right, and we need a just right moon. Uh, the moon has about 20 different features that are fine-tuned to make the existence of advanced life possible on our planet. Now, all this evidence for fine-tuning of all these different size scales allows us to develop a number of tests for whether or not the design we're seeing is from natural causes or supernatural causes. And as I mentioned, this is really coming out of what's called the anthropic principle, which leads to an anthropic purpose, that the amazing cosmic fine-tuning to make human life possible implies that one of the universe's purposes is to provide a home for humanity. You know, several years ago on the British Broadcasting Network, they had a debate between Stephen Hawking, who is a deist, and Roger Penrose, who is a theist. They're the ones that are responsible for the first of the space-time years. Uh, but Roger Penrose uh, debated Stephen Hawking, making the point that we look at the universe as not just that it points to some kind of a being, that's responsible for the mathematics. We see in the mathematics and in the physics and astronomy evidence for purpose that the universe has been designed to make a home for humanity. Now, out of this, we can develop some tests. This is something we've been doing over the past 12 months and reasons to believe with our scientific team. 
that if we're looking at a universe where no creator is responsible for its features, we would anticipate that as you learn more about the universe, this list of desired evidences would decrease in number, and also we would anticipate that the degree of fine-tuning that's required to make life possible would also decrease. And consequently, evidence for a biblical God as a designer would get progressively weaker and weaker as we learn more and more about the universe. On the other hand, if there really is some kind of divine creator, we would anticipate the opposite, that these design evidences would increase both in number and in degree of fine-tuning, and that evidence for a biblical God as a designer would get progressively stronger and stronger as we learn more and more. Now, the first research we did on this was back in 1995, and this would be the second edition of uh, my book, The Creator and the Cosmos. And going through the scientific literature, uh, we found 41 different features of the Milky Way galaxy and solar system that needed to be fine-tuned to make life possible. And back then, the measuring accuracy wasn't as good as it was today, and so we wound up concluding that there was one chance in 10 to the 58 that you'd find a planet anywhere in the entire observable universe that would have these characteristics that would make life possible. And when you account for the dependency factors, it gives you a probability of less than one chance in 10 to the 31 that you'd find such a body without invoking some kind of divine being performing miracles. That was 1995. What we've seen in the intervening few years is that the list is getting bigger and bigger, and the degree of fine-tuning is becoming more and more remote. And the last time we made a posting on our website, uh, there were 676 different features of the galaxy, and uh, by the way, the local groups involved in that as well, uh, and our uh, solar system, in order to make life possible, and less than one chance in 10 to the 556 that all these conditions would be met. And again, if you want to see the, uh, uh, the citations of the scientific literature and the description of the features, uh, they're posted uh, on our website. But moving on to another test, if there's no creator, we would anticipate these evidences would be focused on life in general and not humans in particular. If all we're looking at is natural causation, it doesn't really care whether you're a bacterium or a human being. And so we anticipate that we're not going to see a focus on humanity, but rather in some context, life in general. On the other hand, if we're taking the Bible as a guide, it makes the claim repeatedly that God made this entire universe specifically for the benefit of human beings, that humanity is the focus of the universe having the features that it does. So what we did is we took the data that uh, we showed you just earlier and uh, broke it down into three categories, uh, taking these uh, scientific studies and saying, what do you need to find a planet that's capable of supporting bacteria for 90 days or less? And compare that to what you need for a planet that can support bacteria for 3 billion years. And you say, what's the difference? If it's only 90 days, you don't have to recycle nutrients. But if you're talking 3 billion years, and you've got to design the planet in such a way that you can keep feeding these bacteria over and over again. Some find some way to circulate the nutrients they need so they don't consume all their resources and simply die. And if that takes uh, quite a bit more fine-tuning than just bacteria that gobble up the resources for a few days and simply uh, pass away. And then the third category is where you have a plant uh, that can sustain the equivalent of human beings, advanced life. And you can see that the number of design features dramatically rises uh, when you bring in the need to support humanity, and likewise the probability less than one chance in 10 to the 1,050. Well, again, the third test. If there's no creator, we would expect to see design evidences on some size scales, but not all size scales. So if you look at the biblical claims about this design for the benefit of humanity, that makes the point that it's on all scales that we would anticipate to see uh, this fine-tuning design. The universe, 
the galaxy cluster in which we live, the galaxy, the planetary system, the star on the planet, the planet's surface, the light on the planet, all of it uh, would be uh, revealing fine-tuned design features uh, to make possible the existence of the equivalent of human beings. And if we go through our database here, we see that from a cluster of galaxies, 99 different features must be fine-tuned, with a probability of less than one chance in 10 uh, to the 62 of finding a galaxy cluster uh, that would possibly support advanced life. And then we show you the evidence for the galaxy, the planetary system. And those two, the galaxy and the planetary system, it's really been the last three years where we've seen most of the research showing the fine tuning. You know, 20 years ago, we really didn't know enough about galaxies to be able to develop much of a fine tuning argument, uh, but today we actually have a detailed reconstruction of the uh, structure of our Milky Way galaxy that we can compare with other galaxies and uh, put that in the context of the capacity to support life and human life in particular. Uh, the star is something that's been known about for some time, that it takes a very special kind of star to make advanced life possible. Also relatively new is the moon. Uh, we now know 27 features that must be fine-tuned to make life possible. And you know, when you look at our solar system, our moon really does stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, the ratio of the mass of the moon to its planet uh, is 50 times greater for our moon than it is for any other moon that we know of. I think we're up around 160 some odd moons that have been discovered. And the planet is where we find a very high degree of fine tuning. And one that's needing a lot more research is what kind of supporting light do you need on the planet uh, to make human life possible? And you know, we're just discovering just how many bacterial species are critical uh, for the support of human life, for example. So I'd expect that uh, that's where we're going to see the greatest growth within the next few years of putting this to the test. And if there's no creator, we would expect that some life on Earth will be found to serve the needs of humanity. But if there's a creator, we see the claim in the Bible that this is true of all life on the planet Earth, all species we expect to show this. And this, again, is a place where a lot of research needs to be done. What we're looking at here is the interface between astronomy and physics and biology. And frankly, there hasn't been uh, that much diligence on that interface until very recently. Uh, but if there's no creator, we also expect that astronomers would find many systems capable of sustaining advanced life, like the Milky Way galaxy, Sun, Moon, Earth, and Earth's planetary partners. But if there's a creator, we would anticipate that these bodies uh, would prove to be unique. And so far, we don't see any other galaxies like the Milky Way galaxy, that have the characteristics that would indicate that it could support dense light. That's also true of our star of the sun, as well as Jupiter, uh, and yet we can't see any planets like Earth, but as I said, we're up to about 312 gas giant planets and 160 some odd moons. Everywhere we look, we see that uh, the bodies in which we reside are uniquely capable of sustaining advanced life. Now, what you're seeing here is a review of the presentation I gave at uh, Caltech a few days ago at uh, this uh, skeptics conference. There were about 700 atheists in attendance from all over the world. Uh, most of them had advanced degrees. And uh, when they had their chance to come to the microphone and uh, kind of quiz me, uh, very many of them came up with a god of gaps. All you're doing is throwing God in where we've got gaps where we don't know everything. And then my comment on this is, well, actually, gaps exist on both sides of the debate. Uh, you can't say to the theist, you've got no argument for God until all the gaps are, 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 are known. The truth of the matter is, we'll never know everything. There's always anomalies in science. There's always gaps, regions of ignorance, where we don't really know what's going on. However, I would argue that these gaps and these anomalies give us an opportunity to test different creation evolution models. In terms of the naturalistic gaps and the gaps on the theistic side, are the gaps getting bigger or smaller as we learn more and more? With respect to the naturalism of the gaps, everybody talks about the God of the gaps, but there's also the naturalism of the gaps. 
do the naturalistic expl explanatory gaps get bigger or smaller, more or less problematic as scientists learn more? And uh, our colleagues, and for reasons to believe, my colleagues and myself, we've been putting out a number of books making the point that what we document for the origin of the universe, the origin of Earth, life, and humanity, is that from a naturalistic perspective, the gaps are getting dramatically larger as we learn more and more about the origin of humanity. Uh, for example, when we look at the origin of life, <clears throat> we can now document that prebiotics never existed on planet Earth. If you don't have prebiotics, where is your naturalistic mechanism for the origin of life? We can also document that uh, there are no whole chiral molecules that uh, appear through natural process. That was Bonner, uh, uh, Robert Bonner, a number of years ago, who pointed out that planet Earth never had homochiral molecules until life existed here. And then they said, well, homochirality must happen in space. If you're not familiar with that term, uh, homochirality refers to the fact that if you want proteins, all the amino acids have to be lined up. Either all of them have to be left-handed, or all of them have to be right-handed, or you're not going to be able to put those amino acids together to make proteins. Same thing's true with the DNA and the RNA. If the sugars are not all right-handed or all left-handed, you're not going to be able to put the nucleotides together uh, to make these uh, molecules. The problem is, we can't find any naturalistic source of homochiral molecules. It's difficult enough to do it in the lab where you've got skilled biochemists under laboratory conditions trying to put it together. But in terms of trying to find a source, the best they've been able to come up with it would be black holes and neutron stars that produce circularly polarized light. And what they notice there is that uh, in lab experiments, you can get as much as 38% of the molecules as showing an excess of left-handedness or right-handedness, but you can't get 100%. And by the way, the worst environment for light chemistry is the radiation field adjacent to a neutron star or a black hole. I mean, it's automatic destruction burning the molecules you would uh, put together. Well, what's interesting is that uh, in this debate I had at Caltech a few days ago, uh, the atheist there insisted that I speak first, so I did. And then uh, Victor Stenger, the particle physicist, uh, he spoke after me. Uh, and his main argument was that we can design, what he meant by we is theoretical physicists, uh, can conceive, mathematically conceive, of a universe that doesn't have a beginning. And since we can conceive of it, that proves that God doesn't exist. But what he was really doing is proving that we're not limited to just one universe. In fact, he concluded his talk that uh, was something that I actually agreed with. And uh, by the way, we both like uh, bodyboarding. So I got his permission to use his photo. Uh, we share that hobby together. Uh, but what he said is, I do not dispute, and he also put this in a, in a long paper he's written, and it's going in a book that he's bringing up next year. And so uh, again, uh, I do not dispute that life as we know it would not exist if any one of the several of the constants of physics were slightly different. Additionally, I cannot prove that some other form of life is feasible with a different set of constants. And keep in mind this debate took place after six atheist scientists gave 45 to one hour lectures, and they were basically all recognizing, yeah, we can make other universes, mathematical conceptions of other universes, but this is something we can't do. And so he was simply summarizing what had been said by the other speakers. However, he followed up with this statement, but anyone who insists that our form of life is the only one conceivable as making a claim based on no evidence and no theory. And the problem I had with that whole conference, uh, you know, Saturday before last, is that they were all assuming that Christianity only offers one creation. And this is a straw man argument. That they all felt that if they could show that it's possible to conceive of a universe different than ours that doesn't have a beginning, then that defeats the whole Christian paradigm. Well, I wanted at that, that uh, time when my turn came for a response to say, I completely agree. We agree it takes someone much smarter and more powerful than us to design and build a realm where ultimate intelligent life forms could thrive. Making the point that what the Bible really claims is, God makes this universe, puts physical life in it, 
And the purpose for God making this universe, fundamentally, is to bring about the end of all evil and suffering. But with evil and suffering being removed through the physics of this universe, God's intent is to replace this universe with different laws of physics and different dimensionality. It won't be length, width, height, and time, and six small space dimensions anymore. It's going to be a very different kind of universe. And for that matter, the Bible talks about an angelic realm where non-physical intelligent life exists. And so I have no problem with all these atheists being able to conceive of a universe uh, that has uh, different formulations and is mathematically consistent. I said I totally agree with that. That's what the Bible actually says. And so that was an interesting turn in that day. But I also ended my talk there by referring to a brand new experiment uh, that puts naturalism at the biological level to the test. Because several of the speakers were talking about the history of life. Uh, they did recognize that the origin of life is a huge problem uh, for the naturalists, but they're saying once we got life, can't that just simple life evolve to make advanced life? Well, there's been a debate going on for 20 years between two evolutionists. On one side, you've got Stephen Gould, and what he said more than 20 years ago is that evolution is fundamentally unpredictable. If the tape of life were replayed from some point in the distant past, the outcome would be far different than the one we see today. What's referred to as historical contingency. Uh, that because of the way Darwinism works, you're always going to get different outcomes if you were to just repeat this experiment life under different conditions. On the other hand, you've got Simon Conway Morris in Britain uh, coming up with a very different uh, proposal. He says, repeated evolutionary outcomes for species in different habitats and survival stresses occur hundreds of times. He basically says historical contingency must be wrong because we have these hundreds of examples where we do see repeated outcomes. And here's one example. Uh, you've got the chameleon and the sandwich. One's a fish, one's a, um, a, a reptile. Uh, pardon me, uh, not a reptile, but uh, an amphibian. What you notice there is they have identical eye structures. They have eyes that independently move with respect to one another. And unlike our eye, it doesn't focus through the lens, but rather through the cornea. Both of them have cornea. Both of them have an eye cover uh, that protects that cornea. And the design of the eye cover and the movement of that eye cover is identical. They even have the identical tongue structure. Both of them are equipped with a spring-loaded tongue that will zip out and grab the brain and snag it back in and the eyes are designed to facilitate uh, that spring-loaded tongue mechanism. But uh, one lives at, uh, in the ocean, and the other lives in the air, and yet they have these identical features from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, they're not related, uh, and yet they have these structures. And Simon Conway Morris in his book has pointed out literally hundreds of these examples. Another one would be bats and flying lemurs. They both have identical limb structures. Uh, the brain structure of hummingbirds and parrots is virtually identical. And his whole point is that this must be explained by some hidden natural law. He said there's some law of physics out there that's responsible for all these repeated natural outcomes. And Gould for 20 years has been saying to Simon Conway Morris, you're wrong, this isn't going to happen. Well, what took place, again, more than 20 years ago, is a research team at Michigan State University said, let's put this to the test. Now what they did is they ran an experiment. And I think these guys need to be commended. They ran this experiment knowing it was going to take at least 10 years before they get a publishable result. I mean, this world of publisher perish, that's quite remarkable. In fact, they made those 20 years before they had anything to publish. But they ran this experiment. And it was 12 different populations of E. coli bacteria. So why did they pick E. coli? If anything is going to evolve efficiently, it's going to be E. coli. And they also noted that E. coli has the biochemical machinery within each cell of the bacterium that to metabolize glucose and citrate. But the pore structure of the membranes is such that it permits the easy passage of glucose, but not the easy passage of citrate. And they said, well, because it already has the chemical machinery to metabolize citrate, let's see if we can get the E. coli bacteria 
to evolve from feeding on glucose to feeding on citrate. Because all you need to do is make a few adjustments in the pore structure, and then the citrate can come through. Well, one reason why it took longer is because it turns out that uh, evolution is not as efficient as they thought it was. And uh, they ran the experiment literally for 44,000 <coughs> generations, over 20 years. But the bottom line is, they wound up proving that Gould was right and Simon Conway Morris was wrong. Only one of the 12 populations evolved the capacity to feed on citrate, but at an enormous cost, it lost its capacity to feed on the glucose. So it forgot the citrate, but not the glucose. And also, when it did feed on citrate, it wasn't as efficient uh, in its growth patterns as the 11 remaining populations <coughs> feeding on glucose. And they really forced these populations. What they did is they raised all 12 of them in an environment that was extremely poor in glucose and extremely rich in citrate. So they are raised in near starvation conditions if they were depending on the glucose, but they had everything they would want if they would simply move towards the citrate. Now, the experiment was elegant because for each of the 12 populations, every time 500 generations went by, they grabbed a bit of the bacteria and put it in cold storage, suspended animation. And so when they finally got the result they wanted, where they got one of the populations to feed on citrate, what they did is they took that one successful population, if you could use that word, and they would go back. By the way, they got it to happen. I think it was at 31,600 generations. And so they went back to 31,000 generations. So let's take that out of cold storage and let it grow again and see if it will duplicate the citrate feeding capability. And in a few cases, it worked. And so they said, let's go back another 500 generations and another 500 <coughs> generations. What they discovered is they went previous to 16,000 generations, it would never work. And the more generations they went back, the more difficult it was to recover this citrate feeding capability. Meanwhile, they watched the other 11 populations to see if anything would happen. Nothing has happened. The experiment is still running. They want to push it up beyond 60,000 generations, but that's going to be a few years hence. But they did publish this paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they basically said we've run the experiment long enough to conclude that Gould is right and Simon Conway Morris is wrong. And if Simon Conway Morris was right, we should be seeing the evidence. We're not seeing the evidence. Well, this is a remarkable conclusion because what they're demonstrating is that something beyond natural means must be responsible for the hundreds of examples of repeated evolutionary outcomes that Simon Conway Morris has generated. And for what it's worth, my colleague, Fazal Lana, has written a book called The Cell's Design. I think we've got a few at the table back there, where he does the same thing at the biochemical end of the spectrum. And in that book, you'll see that he's documented over 100 examples of repeated evolutionary outcome at the level of biochemistry, biochemical molecules. So both in terms of the biochemistry and the entire uh, organisms, we see these repeated examples of uh, evolutionary outcomes. Now, you say, how come we're seeing this in the lab, and clearly something was going on in the past? And if we run up to the lab today, we see no repeated outcomes. But as you look at the fossil record, as Simon Conway Morris documents, we see hundreds. In fact, he's confident that we'll see thousands if we do the research. The explanation I would submit is found in the first page of the Bible. On God's seventh day, he rests. He creates for six days, and that's where you're going to see the repeated outcomes. But on the seventh day, he stops doing it. So we run an experiment today, we don't see repeated outcomes. You do it in the past, you do. And in summation, we take this a little bit further, and take the literal definition of the word for day, yom, in the Bible is a long time period. This is something a lot of English readers fail to pick up. That word for day in Genesis 1 has four different literal definitions. Part of the daylight hours, all of the daylight hours, a 24-hour period, or a long but finite period of time. And unlike English, the only word you've got in Biblical Hebrew for a long period of time is that word yom, as translated day. We also note that the frame of reference for the six creation days is not the heaven, 
as the surface of the earth. The Spirit of God was brooding on the surface of the waters, Genesis 1-2. Making those two points, we can evaluate how well the Bible does in predicting the story of creation. Because after all, Moses wrote this 3,400 years ago, long before science has any clue about the history of life on planet Earth. But the remarkable thing is, he scored four for four on the initial conditions, predicting the initial conditions uh, for the history of life on planet Earth, and got a perfect score of 10 for 10 on the events of creation of Genesis. And I actually ended with this in my debate with Victor Stenger at Caltech a few days ago, because I was anticipating that these audience of atheists had serious misconceptions about what the Bible teaches about the history and the order of creation. And that bore out in the Q&A time about 80% of the questions I got had were issues about the Bible, not about the science uh, that I had presented. Uh, but in summation, what we have here at the back, I think we, well, we sold out this morning, but you can order this. This is one of my latest books called Creation of Science. And what we've done in Creation of Science is we finish off the book with 90 predictions. 90 predictions based on our model, what we anticipate scientists will discover within the next three to five years. But I think what makes it useful is we do a side-by-side -side comparison of our 90 predictions with the same kind of predictions you would make from a naturalistic perspective, from a young earth creationist perspective, and a theistic evolutionary perspective. Now, I'm not pretending that those are the only four models uh, for creation and evolution. And the scientific literature, I found over 20 different models for creation and evolution. But these are the four most prominent models that are out there. And so the whole point here is there's no need to have a huge court battle or a big political fight uh, or a debate on a university campus. Uh, all we need to do is wait three or four years and see whose predictions come true and whose predictions fail to come true. Now, we put this in print two years ago. And so you can actually get the book and see how well we've done, because about half of the predictions we've made uh, have been fulfilled uh, since that time. In fact, I've got a new book coming out uh, within uh, a few months where we actually evaluate how the four models have done in light of the past uh, two years of uh, research. Now, if you want to be kept up to date on some of the latest scientific discoveries that allow us to put these different models to the test, Every week we feature a two-hour webcast where scientists uh, get on uh, the internet and it's live. You're welcome to interact. We take calls literally from around the world. You get to hear people who disagree with us uh, calling in and uh, we have these little mini debates. Uh, every show is archived so you can go to our website and listen to it anytime you want. And also we make available uh, a magazine that keeps you up to date on at least a few of these emerging scientific discoveries that allow us to put our faith in the text. And uh, incidentally, the uh, last word we heard from Victor Stenger in that debate, because we were all asked to end our statement with uh, one sentence. Hey, we had seven panelists up there, so we had six atheist speakers and myself, and uh, Victor Stenger was last, and he said to the audience, remember, you are all cold nothing. And I went up afterwards to congratulate him, saying, you're the only honest atheist that's here. I mean, that's really what's happening if you take an atheistic perspective. We have no purpose, we have no destiny, uh, we really no point thinking about morality. We're simply cold nothing, or the product of cold nothing, and cold nothing will return. And I uh, said, well, I've been trying to convince all these other atheists that are up here that that's really the way it is. So uh, it was a very friendly time. Uh, we got along very well. We definitely had our points of disagreement, but I'll tell you this, unlike other conferences I've been at within the church, none of those atheist scholars attacked my character. And uh, it was a very cordial time for everyone. So I am encouraged that people can disagree on these issues and uh, not get mean-spirited uh, in the process of a debate. But at this time, I'd like to take uh, some questions uh, from you. Uh, any comments you want to bring up that doesn't have to pertain to tonight's talk? Whatever you want to talk about would be fine. Yes? Um, I understand from your website, uh, you don't believe that there is any evolution, that every single species is created um, as initials by God's Well, what 
we do say about uh, the evolution of species of life is it will depend on the species. I mean, where I think this Michigan State team was on track, uh, these species that are going to have the highest probability for efficient evolutionary advance are going to be bacteria. You know, they have very small body sizes, huge populations, very short generation times. That's where Darwinism is going to be the most efficient. And I think that's the strength of their experiment, that something was going to happen through natural causation, this is bound to show it, because it's evolution at its most efficient. Where evolution would be at its least efficient would be, say, whales and horses, because now you've got a huge body size, a small population, and a long generation time. In fact, a number of articles have been pointing out that the body size exceeds three kilograms, the probability of evolutionary change is essentially zero. So in that sense, we're saying, uh, yeah, we're looking at supernatural interventions uh, for birds and mammals and your reasonably large-sized body creatures. A couple of mathematical biologists that have uh, volunteered for us, uh, they claim that the dividing line is probably going to be somewhere around a body size of one centimeter at generation time of three months and a population size of one quadrillion. That if a species exceeds a quadrillion individuals, is able to reproduce in less than three months, has a body size of less than one centimeter, uh, then there's at least a chance of some significant natural evolutionary change. But if those conditions aren't met, uh, nothing's going to happen beyond the species level. Now, in your non-evolutionary model, how do you explain the strong correlation between geographic isolation and biological diversity? Well, that's part of our model, is that uh, we would anticipate that this would happen, but uh, what we're seeing here are changes within a species. You're not generating a new order or a new phylum. But they I mean, well, why, why does Australia have only um, marsupials and not placentals, for example? Sure. Uh, again, we, we, we do have a detailed biological model where we try to explain this. And again, from a biblical perspective, the Bible draws the line at soulless creatures. Uh, birds and mammals that are endowed with mind, will, and emotions that they can not only relate to members of their own species, but relate to the human species. From the biblical perspective, that's where supernatural intervention is necessary to explain the speciation events. But what does it say of the plants and the lower animals? Let the land produce. Let the oceans produce. The verb there, dasha, in the Hebrew, leaves open the possibility that these are explained by natural means, but it also leaves open the possibility for supernatural intervention or a combination of the two. And so it's important to recognize that some of these uh, questions of, you know, where does the natural process come in and where does it end, that the Bible is relatively neutral on that topic. This is an issue where scientists need to get involved and see if we can come up with a sharper dividing line, a more detailed <coughs> definition than what the Bible provides. And in that sense, even on our own team, we have a fair range of divergent viewpoints on exactly how do we explain the history of life on planet Earth. Uh, but what we're trying to do with reasons to believe is be interdisciplinary. We would argue, for example, that the physics of the sun is a huge factor in explaining why the fossil record looks the way it does. And that, uh, you know, that's kind of the missing ingredient I see in a lot of evolutionary biology, is that they don't recognize that planning is necessary to know what life forms you need on the planet at a particular time and which life forms you need to remove. And Psalm 104 brings it up. It makes the point that it's the property of all life to die off, but God recreates. So part of our creation model is the divine being aggressively removing life from the planet to make room for new life forms that would be perfectly adapted to compensate for the changes that are going on in the solar system. So the solar system does not provide a stable environment for a single form of life. You need to keep changing the life forms so those life forms can compensate for what's going on in the physics of the solar system. Uh, an obvious example would be the fact that the sun has gotten 15% brighter over the past three billion years. So somehow you have to change the atmosphere and change the rates of silicate erosion so that you can bring down the heating uh, holding capacity of the planet to compensate, or pardon me, bring that down to compensate for the brightening of the sun. 
which means you need someone who's intelligent enough to know the future physics of the sun. But again, that creator can use a combination of natural process and supernatural intervention to bring about his desired ends. So, yes. Um, I, I'm curious about um, uh, comments about the word yom, like you the word yom. I understand it's like your forte may not be uh, linguistic and stuff, but um, as I recall, the passage says that it was morning and evening, and then it was the first day. Right, and right. And so that would seem to indicate to me that that's referring to a more of a 24 hour period than a long length of time. And I was curious if you comment on that. Well, for what it's worth, I have done some linguistic studies on this, and uh, several of the people who volunteer for us are, are Hebrew linguists by profession, uh, with doctoral degrees in, in the area. And uh, I have a book at the back called A Matter of Days, where I take that issue on in considerable detail. And uh, you know, in terms of the evening and morning phrase that we see bracketing each of the creation days, the Hebrew words for evening and morning likewise have multiple uh, definitions. The thing about the Hebrew language, uh, at least Biblical Hebrew as opposed to modern Hebrew, is that the vocabulary size is incredibly small. Uh, 3,000 words if you don't count the proper nouns. So almost every single Hebrew noun has multiple literal definitions. So the words for evening and morning, for example, can also mean beginning and ending. And what you notice in Genesis 1 is you've got an evening and a morning for the first six days but there is no evening and morning for day seven. And for good reason, if you go on into Hebrews 4, uh, one of the many creation accounts in the Bible, you'll see it refers to God's seventh creation day as ongoing through the present and into the future. And so when God created the first humans, Adam and Eve, that's when he stopped creating. And he will not create again physically until evil and suffering have been conquered and removed. So the seventh day is ongoing. We're still in the seventh day. And we're still in the seventh day. That confirms, as one of the confirmations, that the appropriate definition, literal definition to use for Yom is a long but finite period of time. And it also explains this experiment, how we can't duplicate the repeated outcomes today, but clearly they were happening in the past before human beings existed. And also the other thing you can notice is that Genesis 1, with respect to human beings, says that they were both the first human male and the first human female, and tells us were created on day 6. But if you flip the page to Genesis 2, it tells us that Adam was created first, and he was created outside the Garden of Eden, and he was allowed in that context to watch the trees of the Garden of Eden grow. God placed him inside the Garden of Eden, and told him to tend the garden. Now this is God introducing Adam to the physical creation. And God worked, or Adam worked that garden to realize, yeah, this is an enjoyable task, but there's got to be more to life than gardening. And at that point, God said, now I want you to name all the birds and mammals. This is the soulish creation. These are creatures, unlike the plants, that are able to relate to him at an emotional level. And he assigns an appropriate name to each of these birds and mammals. And then God puts him to sleep, uh, performs surgery on him, pulls a biopsy from his side, which would give him the DNA template. And uh, Adam recovers from the surgery, and then he sees this new creature. And the Hebrew word that's recorded is coming out of his mouth the moment he sees Eve is the word hapa'am. It's only used four other times in the Old Testament, every time translated at long last which means the sixth day must also be a long period of time. And that's kind of what we do in our book, A Matter of Days. We take you through the 25 creation accounts of the Bible and say, which interpretation is both literal and consistent? My biggest complaint with young earth creationism in terms of what they do with the Bible, it forces the Bible to contradict itself. But if you take the days as long time periods, there's no internal contradiction. Yes. Okay, 
Okay, is your argument is that can't we just say that all this by tuning is by pure chance rather than by design? How do you know this is by chance? Well, uh, this happened at this uh, Caltech event. Uh, you know, three of the theoretical physicists there were trying to claim, well, yeah, we see all this fine tuning, but maybe it's simply by pure chance that it has all this enormous fine tuning. Uh, and you know, when um, Leonard Susskind, for example, said there might be as many as 10 to 500 string theory solutions to the universe, and you know, we just simply don't have the mathematical acumen to narrow it down any more than that. And he used that as an opportunity to speculate that there might be 10 to the 500 different universes with different laws of physics. Now, we did admit that that was pure speculation. But the point is, the fine-tuning level is now one part in 10 to the 1,050. And so 10 to the 500 universes is not enough to explain the level of fine-tuning that we see. Now, another physicist came up and said, what about the multiverse? And that's really kind of where the atheistic community, in terms of trying to explain this fine-tuning, has settled. They said, let's hypothesize that there's an infinite number of universes out there. And let's presume they all have different physical characteristics. Each one is a different set of physical laws distinct from all the other infinite number of universes. And then our universe, by pure chance, has the physical characteristics that uh, make life possible. Well, I'm arguing that's testable. Uh, you know, that, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the evidence is going to get weaker for my model rather than stronger. Well, let's wait a few months and see what happens. In fact, what we notice is about 10 scientific discoveries per day are coming into the literature that allow us to put these ideas to the test. So we really don't have to wait long. I'm willing to stick my neck out for six weeks and see whether the case for my model gets stronger or it gets weaker. If it gets weaker, then I'm going to have to make some revisions to my model. So, so do you think you, you proved the existence of the Christian God or provided evidence for it? Yes. So doesn't that make sense? Not prove, but provide evidence for it. As I mentioned at the beginning, I can't prove my wife exists. So, so All I've got is a high probability. So now that I've seen evidence of the existence of God, it makes it impossible for me to have faith in God because, uh, I mean, you can't have faith in something if you've already seen evidence for it. No, that's not true. Uh, that's a huge misunderstanding. The Bible has three Hebrew words for faith and one Greek word for faith. All four of these words have the base definition, acting on what you've established to be true. It was the Apostle Paul who said, everything must be tested. Hold fast to that which is good. So the foundation of the Christian faith is don't believe until you put it to the test. It's not blind faith. It's a provable faith. Well, I mean, there's different levels of testing. Uh, I remember one trip I took to China, I ran into this old farmer, and he said, you know, the evidence for me is my thumb. He looked at his thumb and said, you know, that's not going to happen without some God being out there. So that was his test. You know, there's testing at different levels. Theoretical physicists have to do it mathematically uh, through arcane equations. Uh, a farmer has a different kind of test. So, and the thing I notice is that uh, where there's greater pride, there's more need for more extensive evidence. Mm -hmm. I think what I was seeing in Caltech is here a lot of very well-educated people, extremely bright. And the thing I've noticed in my years at Caltech is how these very brilliant people take credit for their high IQ. And my comment is, give credit to your parents. Give credit to God, but you have nothing to do uh, with your very high IQ. Uh, so why take any pride in your intelligence? That has nothing to do with you. But it does seem to be a property of these brilliant scientists to do that very thing. And often I think that's what keeps them from recognizing uh, some of the things I've been talking about. As it tells us in the Bible, there's no way you can come to God without humility. And the other thing I've noticed too among scientists, it's so easy for us to get fascinated by the world of nature that we study. I mean, it's true, when you look at nature, it's just incredibly beautiful and elegant, and it's so easy to get focused on that. 
as, as uh, Paul said in the book of Romans, the human tendency is to worship the creation rather than the one who is responsible for the creation. I think that's most difficult for a scientist because we're paid to study the creation. But as far as the multiverse goes, let me just say a word about that. Because that really is where atheism stands these days. They're saying we can explain all this design by an infinite number of universes. Number one, they didn't even propose that until the design evidence in the words of Paul Davies, the agnostic, became overwhelming. So the timing is suspicious. It was only proposed in the last few years when they were really stuck with all this incredible evidence for design. Uh, number two, it's a form of the gambler's fallacy. And let me illustrate that. Uh, supposing I flip a coin here, and it comes up heads. I flip it 100,000 consecutive times, it comes up heads every single time. Two possibilities. The coin has been designed to come up heads, or it came up heads by pure chance. And the problem with the guy proposing this by pure chance, he or she is assuming that there's enough coins out there to justify the pure chance conclusion. Uh, we call it the gambler's fallacy because you have no evidence that two to the 100,000 coins exist that are all being flipped by two to the 100,000 people a 100,000 times where they're all getting different results. One of the critiques I offer in the multiverse, what is there in the physics that guarantees that you're going to get different laws of physics every time a universe comes about? You know, it's kind of embarrassing they all come up the same. Or if you get a range of physical constants that never appear. I mean, that could happen. Uh, but the foundation of the multiverse answer to design is to say that every conceivable set of laws of physics will be produced by these infinite number of universes. You know, that's just simply an assumption. We have no evidence and no physics or math to support that conclusion. And then the real problem with the universe is it's very different from the point. General relativity tells us that if you've got two universes, once you've got observers in universe A, its space-time manifold can never overlap the space-time manifold of any other possibly existing universe, which means that science will never be able to prove the existence of a second universe. If God made five, we'll never know. Those four will be completely uh, unavailable for us to scientifically investigate. So it means you're resting your conclusion uh, on a pure speculation. And finally, I would say of the multiverse, it explains too much. If there really is an infinite number of universes, all with different physical characteristics, where every conceivable set of physical characteristics uh, happens, then that means that there would not only be an infinite number of universes, there would be an infinite number of planets, just like planet Earth. And an infinite number of planets, like planet Earth, there would be an infinite number of beaches, and those infinite number of beaches would be an infinite number of markings, and an infinite number of markings, which would have all the markings that appear in one of my books at the back table. Which means anything that we produce is utterly meaningless. Or, as uh, Martin Rees pointed out, if you're really going to appeal to a multiverse, it's really no different than what you see in the movie The Matrix. Maybe everything we're in is simply a pure illusion, and there's no reality at all. So in that sense, it really does explain too much and would undermine the whole discipline of science. And incidentally, one of the atheists at this conference actually made that point, that we really got to stop appealing to the multiverse because it's anti-science rather than pro-science. But you had a Paul, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, in your analogy, the universe is flipping 100,000 coins. Well, every single possible outcome of 100,000 coins is equally likely, whether it be all heads or tails or some combination. And so if the universe is created, and you see the coins are flipped, we can look at whatever combination um, of outcomes we've got and say, oh, look, this is really unlikely. But we can say that about whatever outcome we've got. Yeah, but a lot of those outcomes have no purpose or meaning. It's kind of like playing poker. Uh, there's all kinds of hands that aren't going to win the pot. And there's only a few hands that ever will flush it. Well, let me complete the analogy of the gambler's fallacy. You see a coin coming up that hits 100,000 times, and you say, I'm going to bet that it's a fair coin. Well, I would say, if you saw the coin come up heads 100,000 times in a row, you'd be wise to say, before I bet tails on the next flip, let me examine the coin. I want to see if there's heads on both sides. 
I want to see has been weighted to all these come up ends. And you say, well, can you do that with the universe? My point is certainly we can do that with the universe. We can choose to wait three months and examine the universe in more detail than we already have. And in examining it in more detail, we see more compelling evidence for supernatural design rather than less. That's really the equivalent of seeing heads on both sides of the coin. So in that sense, the gambler's fallacy is a testable hypothesis. Thank you. Right. Um, my question takes it back a little bit to your comment about faith. And you said that faith uh, should be based on some sort of evidence. And that evidence being, I presume, somewhat empirical. But isn't that faith based on reason? And then wouldn't just there be no faith at all only reason? Well, if you were to look at what Paul wrote about this subject, in Romans 7, he makes the point that we have the law of the mind, which agrees with the law of God, and protects us from being deceived at the level of the spirit. And so he really is making the point that we are to use our minds to test these different ideas. Now, where I wouldn't part company with you, I'm not saying that the only evidences are empirical evidence. What we've been talking about tonight uh, is testing uh, the divine involvement at the physical level or the empirical level. But as you've already heard me say tonight, God has made life at the physical level, at the soulish level, and at the spirit level. And therefore, that opens up a level of testing beyond the realm of the empirical. And I'm not saying in any way that that's in doubt. That's in addition to what we can do at the empirical level. Uh, but nevertheless, it's quite clear the Bible is telling us don't believe until you first put it to the test. You don't want to be deceived. Then that's not faith. Yes, it is. That's exactly what faith is. Faith is acting upon what you know to be true. Notice there's two components. To have biblical faith, you have to do something to establish that it's true. But a lot of people establish things are true and fail to act on it. It's not faith unless you act on what you know to be true. So, for example, as a physicist, I have faith in neutrinos. I've not only done some study to convince myself that neutrinos are real, I actually live my life as if neutrinos are real. And so, that's kind of an analogy at the level of uh, science. But I know lots of people who are fully convinced that God exists, but refuse to act on that knowledge. And I would say they don't have faith. They got the knowledge, they've done the uh, evidence of showing that it's true, but they don't act on what they know to be true. Uh, both components are critical. In the back there? Yeah, I'm not I'll get to you next. If uh, you have a creator, <coughs> if we have to be, and the creator itself being so responsible for the creation, is he himself the very unique as well. Wouldn't he also have for the creator? And then that would mean that it's so on and on and on. Okay. This is a question I get every time I speak on this topic, who created God? Um, my kids ask me that question when they were three years of age. Uh, so it's a very common, it's been asked for thousands of years. Uh, now, what you've heard tonight is that uh, there's a causal agent beyond space and time that creates space and time. That puts the creator in a different context than the universe and all the components of life within the universe. He is beyond time. The significant point there is time is that dimension or realm in which cause and effect phenomena take place. What you notice here is you've got this entity creating time independent of cosmic time. And so causality is in a totally different category for the creator than it is for us human beings or the universe or anything confined within the universe. We are restricted to a single dimension of time where time can't be stopped or reversed. And in that context, everything must have a beginning, everything must have a creator. What we're talking about is a divine being who's not under that kind of temporal restriction. It's a being who actually creates time, can create space and time at will, and remove it at will. And therefore, he's not bound by the cause and effect restrictions we're bound by. For example, when you have the creator creating time, what that creator is doing is actually operating the equivalent of two independent dimensions of time. So for the universe, time is linear, and it can't even be stopped or reversed. But for the creator, at a minimum, it's the equivalent to a plane of time, 
break out a length of time and a width of time. Well, if that's the case, you could uh, put the timeline of our universe over here and have the creator operating on an infinite number of timelines that never cross or touch the timeline of the universe. As such, that being has no beginning, no ending, and is uncreated. And if you look at the different holy books of the religions of the world, the Bible stands alone in saying that God has no beginning and no ending. But it also stands alone in saying that God can arbitrarily compress time or expand time. A day of the Lord is like a, uh, you know, a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. A thousand years is like a watch in the night. You can make it arbitrarily small or arbitrarily large. Mathematically, that's only possible if you have the uh, capability of operating through cause and effect in the equivalent of two dimensions of time. And so we see a consistent description throughout the Bible of God's temporal capabilities uh, which relieve him from any kind of necessity of having a beginning. So it's in a totally different uh, category. And uh, we got a couple of books that talk about Beyond the Cosmos is probably the most extensive book that we have on that theme. We actually diagram it all up for you mathematically. You're next. Yes. Um, there was a book written by uh, Bart Ehrman, I believe, who uh, had a title called Misquoting Jesus. And then he said that there are more variations of the New Testament than there are words in the New Testament, which means how can you take the Bible as a reference book for all these predictions that you are making when the Bible itself 